Okay, thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me here. Um, and it's really great actually to follow Petros's stuff because he showed some very specific application of um, digital human modeling, so with the steer suite, et cetera. Um, I'm, I want to take a slightly different approach and think of it as the way we are sort of approaching some of the digital human modeling is not necessarily from a specific application perspective, but how do we create a unified uh, representation of the different levels of the human ana anatomical form? Um, how do we actually represent it for, for a knowledge base so that it can be understood within the computer um, and actually create sort of this unified representation? So whether you're thinking about the human body as you know, a, a, a particle, so an abstraction of the particle, or whether you're at the, the uh, limb level, or whether you're getting down to the muscular level or the nervous level, all of those things are actually connected. And it's really just a matter of sort of starting with a parent node and really just going deeper and deeper into the levels of complexity. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is actually a bunch of work that uh, we've been doing in very strong and close collaboration with the Musculoskeletal Anatomy Laboratory at the University of Toronto with uh, Dr. Ann Auger who's been collecting a bunch of anatomical data. So we've been working on helping her to collect the data as well as process it. And now, how do we actually um, make that data accessible to a larger um, audience? So there are a number of applications of digital human modeling. So you, know, you see it with these avatars or animation. But there's also a whole bunch that, that want to get a lot more deeper into the anatomical form. Uh, for example, biomedical simulation, surgical simulation, all of these types of things where now you want to delve deeper and deeper into the details of the body. Um, so I just want to back up a little bit the idea of form itself. So a lot of people, when you hear the word form, just think of it more from the geometric or spatial side of things where you're really thinking about proportion or the size and shape. So for example, how do we vary in terms of how we look, right? Our, our overt uh, geometric characteristics. But another important aspect of form is the actual organization of the pieces. So the topology, the arrangement, right? And so this, for example, at the, at the level of the entire human body might just be as simple, simple, as creating some kind of internal skeleton where now instead of just a static form that we're using to quantify or be able to shift between various um, forms of, of the human body, uh, now you have some kind of internal skeleton where now, for example, you could actually move. So now you're incorporating things like limb lengths and, and all of these other types of things. Okay? Or again, within some types of context, you might actually want to add in some type of representation of muscles. And so a lot of biomechanical models, for example, create very simplified or relatively simplified versions of muscles where it's really just line segments that represent, okay, the muscle starts here and it attaches down here, and, and that's sort of it. But it creates sort of these, this mechanical basis for generating movement under, over top of that skeleton underneath the body or underneath the skin. Um, one of the areas where the, the unification or the, the more unified vision of, of variation in form comes about is actually in studying the brain. So looking at how the size and shapes of the brains, the complexity of the, the uh, ridges and valleys, so those, those, those sulky and, and gyri of the brain actually um, differ. Uh, as well as the individual parts of the brain, the individual structures inside the brain. And, and this is used a lot for diagnosis of things like schizophrenia and Alzheimer's and things like that. And then from the structural side, of course, you have things like medical imaging, which actually can show us what types of uh, structural connectivity occurs. So how are these different internal structures of the brain actually connected? And in that sense, you can effectively think of the brain as a network. And then when you collect things like brain activity, you can actually map the activity, so this functional connectivity, over top of the structural connectivity. And it gives you a lot better idea 
of sort of this flow of information in order to generate you know, movements or sensations or, or whatnot. Okay. Um, but this hasn't been done so much for the actual general anatomy, looking at the bones and the muscles and the, and the, the nerves and things like that. So we're thinking about it to some extent. How do we connect up the brain, for example, with all the rest of the body? Because really, we're just this complex system of systems or network of networks, however you want to think about it. Right? Um, so we've started with sort of three of the, the um, human systems, the skeletal system, so the bones, the muscles, and the, and the uh, peripheral nerves. Um, so I'll just start a little bit with some of the, the geometrical representation. So this is one example of a specific bone in the wrist, okay? And it's five different instances, so, so from five different individuals. And if we wanted to create a statistical model of this so that we can actually, actually represent um, how these bones vary across these individuals, we can't just create a statistical model from this. We first need to actually align them, because we want to align the features so that then we're describing them uh, in, a, in a statistical way. right? And this is quite difficult to do in this shape space. right? We can sort of eyeball it, but to be able to quantify it becomes a lot more challenging. So what you can actually do is you can actually project these, these complex geometries onto something like a sphere, for example. So this is just a visualization. Effectively, what we're doing is we're taking the, we're computing the, the centroid of the bone, and then you just project rays out in all the different directions, and you're computing the distance from the centroid to, the, uh, to where the, the ray intersects the, the surface of the bone. Okay? So you get this visualization. Okay? And the nice thing about the sphere is then you can actually unwrap it so that instead of having to manipulate it in three dimensions, you can actually flatten it out into a plane. And now you can see the entire surface in one view. Okay? Um, you can use this representation to actually then rigidly align them. Because remember what I said, if we want to create a statistical model, we need to align all of these common features. right? So now you can actually get a visualization, even in this parameter space, of how these bones actually vary. Okay? And then we can project that back up into the shape space to help align those bones. And then uh, we do some non-rigid registration, which basically means we start deforming the meshes. Right? And what, we're effectively, what we effectively want to do is you can see in this on the sphere in the parameter domain, there's a bunch of, of triangles. Okay? This is effectively creating regions of correspondence amongst the instances, so that as we project it down into the complex geometrical space or the shape space, right? Now you're effectively you're sort of, you can sort of match up these these subsets or these specific regions that might be used to define some of these features but we have actual corresponding regions across the varying, the, the varying instances of the bone. Okay. Um, and then from that, we can create these statistical models where, for example, down the middle in the blue would be your average or your mean model. Right? And then uh, we're effectively defining what these modes of variation are. Okay? So each of the different modes basically is, is describing one specific characteristic of variation, for example, of how, how you can pool it into uh, sort of a unified representation here. Okay? So um, this, is, this is at the very specific bone level. You can also do this with multiple objects where it would take into account the spatial relationships amongst the bones as well and incorporate that into a statistical model. Um, but what we also want to be able to do is actually define what these Feature, what these uh, corresponding features are. And if you look at a standard an anatomy textbook, you get something like this. So this is the tibia, so your shin bone. Okay? Uh, down the left-hand side are, the, are 23 features which are commonly agreed upon by the anatomy world. Okay? And so these are typical labels that you might see uh, identified on a diagram like this. But if you look, for example, at the top middle figure, you get a, a feature, and then you just get a line pointing to it. And it's kind of like, OK, well, is it this point? Is it this surface? If it's this surface, what are the boundaries? What's the extent of it? 
right? So how do we actually turn this into a computational way that we can uh, quantify what, what the variation is in these features? So we're delving a little bit deeper than just the, the whole bone level. So effectively, what we want to be able to do, for example, is paint these specific features, define these, these subsets of the, of the whole surface that correspond to these specific features. Okay? And so how we started thinking about it was actually in creating nodes and, and an adjacency uh, graph. So each of these nodes represents one of those specific features. Um, this specifically relates to the proximal end of, of the tibia. So this is looking down. So this would be, this is the, the, top, the top view of your shin bone, so at the, at the level of the knee. Okay. Um, and so you can actually think of each of these nodes, for example, as being able to relate over to a database where these could take on data properties. So you could actually put in things like surface areas, or if it's a volume, or you know, if it's a length, or if there's curvature features, any of those types of things could effectively be stored in here. But what we want to do is visualize these spatial relationships amongst these um, features. We can also sort of facilitate some of the visualization by changing the shapes of the nodes to correspond to some of the commonly used simplified geometric uh, descriptions of these features. So things like a convex region, right? Or a concave region, or a saddle region, where in one direction it's concave and the other it's convex. Right? Or, sorry, other way around. Um, and then the idea of, of how these, uh, what are the transitions amongst these geometric features as well. So representing those in here. And now, just by looking at the nodes themselves, you start to get this view of the topography of the represent of what the surface that you're representing. Okay. Uh, this is the shaft, so the long part of, of the bone. If you actually cut through it, it's it's a relatively crudely described as as a triangle. Okay. So we can take the three surfaces, for example, and now each of these uh, ridges that go the length of, of the bone. So here's our representation of, of the shaft in a very simplified way. Um, then we want to relate the, the proximal head to that shaft and actually connect it up. So again, we're creating this, this spatial relationship of how is the proximal head related to the shaft. Okay. We can do the same thing for the distal end, so down at the level of the ankle. Okay. But you'll notice between these two, there's common features, right? Because we have these, we have these, the lateral, the medial, and the posterior surface of the shaft are, are common, which means that we can actually hook them up, right? And so now you can imagine if you sort of fold this in on itself and connect up the, the two medial surface and the, and the two posterior surface nodes, now you've effectively created this node, this map, this node-based map on something that could be equated to the sphere, right? So now you're sort of mapping these aspects that we've represented geometrically on the sphere in a way that we can start uh, representing some of these data properties, like I said, surface areas, et cetera, okay? Um, looking at things, I, I mentioned things like curvature. So actually being able to do analysis where we can extract characteristics of ridges and valleys of of these bones. And where this might come in handy is, for example, can we use some of these curvature features to actually distinguish beginnings and ends of features or boundaries of some of these features, right? So in this sense, we're actually computationally quantifying uh, these features as opposed to just looking at them and saying, uh, I would say it's this area, for example, right? Can we actually do it where it would be reproducible and understandable regardless of who would be using it. Okay. Um, of course, that's at, that's at the level of one bone. In certain instances, you're, you might be interested in the connectivity amongst multiple bones. One area that this has been uh, done uh, relatively, uh, there's, been a, there's a, been a decent volume of, of work done in this, uh, is looking at the skull, for example. 
right? So how, even though all these bones have effectively fused, right, um, we can still identify individual bones that comprise the, the cranium, right? How do these different bones connect to one another? So looking at the actual sutures or those connecting lines, right? And you might actually have different instances where once you look at it in this network pattern, you're starting to see some of the variation just based on this node-based type of mapping. Okay? And the nice thing about doing this, this uh, type of network analysis is that you can actually represent these nodes in a matrix. So you, you're actually putting it in a representation on which you can then do statistics on this type of connect, uh, this type of connectivity or, or, or this, this network-based representation of, of this, okay? So for example, you're looking at the skull from, from head on, topologically, it might be perfectly symmetrical, right? We may have exactly the same types of connections on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. But if we equate these different nodes with specific data properties, where we're looking at surface areas and things like that, now we might actually get a better idea of how asymmetrical we actually are, which again might not matter in in an application where we're just, you know, s steering a, a relatively um, like a, a skeletonized version of of a digital human model around. But once we're getting into surgical simulation, uh, we we want to get into that extra detail. So this has been used to identify things like modularity, so connectivity amongst. Um, specific groups of bones, um, how the muscles interact with one another, so these physical interactions amongst the muscles, they're not completely separate and not touching each other, right? They, they actually interact with one another. Or you can combine them into one type of graph. But in this type of graph, you're effectively abstracting the muscle to the level where one node would equate to a single muscle, right? So basically saying, okay, we have this muscle, it attaches this bone and this bone, right? So it sort of assumes a, a, a level of simplicity in terms of how that muscle might operate, okay? But we have some muscles which are ridiculously complex, okay? So this is based on some dissection and digitization work being done at the University of Toronto. So this is the masseter muscle, so this big, this big muscle on the side of your cheek which helps you chew Okay, so if you clench your jaw, that's the guy that pops out on the side here, okay? So this is a, a, the lateral view, so from the side, but also from the front, okay? So if we put that into a node-based graph, we might actually see something like this. So even, in the re, even though in the reconstruction, the, the skull might look as though it's one bone, we can actually split these, these origins of the, the muscles into three different bones, okay? And then, and then ultimately it connects up the, the skull with the mandible or the jaw, okay? But based on dissection, at least in a relatively simplified version or, or representation, there's at least two distinct uh, portions of muscle based on the actual architecture, so the directions of the fibers. So you have a superficial head Right, which is shown in, so the, the direction of the fibers are shown in the yellow, and then you have a deep head underneath it, which actually the fibers go in a different direction. So in that sense, the simplification might need at least two levels, right? So we might need to do something like that, right? And so now the, the connectivity amongst these muscles and bones starts to change a little bit, right? But if we dissect it a little bit further, uh, on the top is the superficial head. This can actually be dissected into four dis architecturally distinct layers or lamina, okay? And same with the, same with the deep head. So now all of a sudden this, this simplified two-layer representation, depending on what you're doing, might not be sufficient. So all of a sudden we might need to go from something like this to something like this. Okay, so the complexity is increasing, but if we're putting it in this network-based analysis where we can represent it in, in the matrix, it's still computationally feasible, right? It, it becomes tougher to do, but you can still do it. Um, 
And not all of these muscles just nicely attach into the bone. Uh, I've added in these, these gray triangles where there's effectively these aponeurotic sheets or tendons in some cases which attach the muscle into the bone. Right? So you can see, for example, in lamina 8, it attaches right from bone into bone, whereas, whereas the majority of these actually have some type of aponeurotic sheet both at the, at the top and at the bottom. Okay? So again, different level of complexity depending on what you want to do with, with the model. And then there's also the innervation. Right? So these, these different heads have, have different branching patterns. So if you were interested in some kind of muscle reanimation um, for, for surgical purposes or neuroprosthetic application, you might actually be interested in how the, 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 the uh, nerves branch into the muscles. Because if you're going to be stimulating them or using them to regain function, you might, not, you might want to or need to get down to this type of level. right? So ultimately, thinking about starting with data, where really we're gathering the, the, the different parts of the body, so dissecting it down to whatever it means to be a part. Right? There's, there's, these different, there's these different levels. But ultimately, what we want to do in a unified representation with these data is to, as much as we can, improve understanding and improve context so that regardless of, of who accesses these data, they're still usable. Right? So connecting up these parts so that we move from data and actually generating informa information from those data that we're collecting. So we're understanding the relationships amongst the, the different pieces of data, right? or the different pieces of anatomy. Um, ultimately creating the whole, so we're actually moving towards a, a representation of the whole knowledge base. So for example, what do the anatomists know, and how might I be able to apply some of these details into my human model? Right? So understanding these patterns. It's understanding these patterns where you can actually begin to define, for example, what is a representative human, if that's what you wanted to use. Right? As opposed to looking at some, well, you know, he's this height, which is the average height, and he's this weight, which is the average weight. That's my, represent that's my representative individual or assuming that you can create something based on, for example, a male, just scale it to a different size and say, OK, now it's a female. There's, there's differences. right? Um, and ultimately, can we actually unify things in such a way where we um, start to understand the principles of variation and, and so move beyond knowledge uh, into the, the wisdom realm and actually being able to represent that in the computer so that, again, um, regardless of who is accessing things, it's, it's all in there and in, and, in principle, understandable regardless of what domain you come from. Okay? So again, regardless of what your application is, uh, you, you can access that, access that, that representation. That's it. We, yes, uh, with, with Anne's lab, uh, there is a bunch of, we've been laser scanning bones from the, from the medical collection. So we actually have bones that we've scanned where we have point cloud representations down to 30 micron resolution um, of these bone surfaces, which is a lot higher resolution than you get, for example, from a lot of the uh, medical imaging techniques. So in that sense, we can actually see a lot of these ridges and valleys, uh, potentially identify attachment sites for some of these muscles, um, for some of these muscles and, uh, and tendons. Um, the, the pictures that I was actually showing of the masseter and whatnot, there's a whole collection of, of data from actual dissections and digitizations of muscles. So looking at how complex are these architectures of the different muscles, and if we start to look across specimens, what types of variation do we actually see? In some cases, again, like I said, it might just be 
Topologically, it might be exactly the same. And where the differences come in are more in these proportions. So the volumes of muscles, for example, or the surface area of, a, of an attachment site or, or things like that. And they've also been getting into um, some of these nerve branching patterns, as well as some of the venous and arterial, so blood vessel um, branching as well. So really trying to get at connecting up and understanding things at this level. I mean, it's, 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 it's tough to do. There's, it's, it needs to keep growing so that we can get to the point where we're thinking about things from a more statistical perspective. Right? What we'd ultimately like to do, obviously, when you're working with human data, it's, it's sensitive. You can't just collect something and say, OK, anyone who wants it, go at it. Right? You have to protect those individuals. So what we would like to be able to do in terms of representing things is can we create things into this statistical representation, both from the geometric perspective but also from the topological perspective, so that, for example, now when you're accessing data, and for example, you can imagine sort of sliding a dial and, and shifting through the, the spectrum of variation in, in shape and, and whatnot, um, can we have enough samples where, for example, anyone would be able to access it because you wouldn't be able to reverse engineer it to identify a specific individual that went into it? So in that sense, can we use statistics to effectively anonymize a, a parameterized representation? of the anatomy. If you want to identify a human, you look maybe at uh, the fingerprint or at, at the retina, because those parts have the most variance between uh, human beings. Do you think from your project you can uh, identify new parts of the human body which have also a high variance, which could be used to identify uh, human beings? It's very possible. Uh, you'd be surprised at how much they can do even just with a skull, <laughs> right? I mean, just the, the shapes of, of the skull and the jaw and everything, uh, you, you actually have to be very careful with those types of data because what they've been able to do in forensics is start with a skull and ef effectively extrapolate what would the muscles be on top of that, and they can fairly accurately reconstruct what the entire facial structure would be to the point where you might actually be able to look at it and say, that's so-and-so. I, I mean, and it makes sense that that's what they're doing in forensics, right? If you have to identify a body, and, and that's all you have to go by, right? So, uh, so absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Do you think you can apply these technologies to provide a more thorough um, system for diagnostic imaging? That's, that's one of the specific applications, right? Would, would be, can we actually unify this in a way where, for example, one of the ways to improve context would be if we could actually link uh, specific data from an individual to their health records, right? Where now you have, instead of just saying, OK, well, I have data for an individual at a specific time frame, if you can get a, a, a more longitudinal uh, view of you know, the, these different doctor visits or surgeries they've had, medication they're on, whatnot, it might actually provide insight into things. Again, as, as our knowledge base improves in terms of how some of these different um, pieces of the health record actually impact who the individual is or what the individual is. But th yeah, I mean, the, uh, from the statistical shape model, for example, perspective, uh, it's already being used. A lot of groups are using statistical shape models exactly for diagnostic reasons. Like all the work being done on the brain, it's being done exactly for that. If you can identify what does a normal or average brain look like, the idea is that you can embed it into the image space and use it to help segment out or you know, identify these individual parts of the brain. And potentially now if you can relate a, a specific individual to a specific disease, for example, or a specific pathology, now you might actually be able to see, OK, with this pathology, these structures are being impacted. And what you see is this 
decrease in size or this very characteristic change in shape and, and whatnot. So they are using it exactly for that as identifying these types of pathologies, potentially catching them earlier on as opposed to once they're pathological or Thank you.